Thank you, sir. So, Dr. John Stephen Piper is going to be talking about uh, other international guidelines on non uh, sugar sweeteners and health disentangling sources of disagreement. John is a clinician scientist who holds appointments as, as an associate professor in the departments of Nutri nutritional sciences and medicine and the lifestyle med medicine lead in the MD program at the University of Toronto. He's also a staff physician in the Div Division of uh, Endocrinology and Metabolism, a scientist in the Lancashire Knowledge Institute and lead of the Tor Toronto 3D Knowledge Synthesis and Clinical Trials Unit at St. Michael's Hospital. Dr. Stephen Piper completed his master's and PhD and postdoctoral fellowship at the U Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto. He completed his medical degree at St. Matthews University, followed by residency training in medical uh, biochemistry at McMaster University in, uh, in, 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 in Ontario, leading to his certification as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada. He's established an inter international recognized research program focusing on the use of randomized controlled trials and epidemiological approaches to address questions of clinical and public health importance. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. Um, in relationship to diet, cardiometabolic metabolic disease prevention, and in particular, interest in the role of sugars and non-sugar sweeteners, carbohydrate quality, and plant-based dietary patterns. John has served on many clinical guidelines. Um, he's he's um, he's a member of the the guidelines committee of Diabetes Canada, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, etc. And he's he's um, he's he's earned and been recognized widely by by earning several re rewards. He is um, he's published over two hundred and forty papers and more than seventeen book chapters. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And it, it's really a pleasure to be able to come and uh, share some of our thinking and research in this area and to be able to put this event on uh, as part of the ICN as a satellite symposium. Um, very hard act to follow. And uh, <laughs> I hope I don't have quite the fireworks in my presentation that that uh, that you had. <laughs> Um, I think that our talks are, are quite complementary. There may be a little bit of overlap. I'll, I'll think I'll show again some of the the WHO guideline, uh, really, um, insofar as to contrast and compare with other um, international guidelines, both clinical practice guidelines, dietary guidelines, making that distinction, and then get into uh, maybe some of the reasons why we see some of the uh, disagreement and try to, as I put in my title, disentangle some of those and, and try to come struggle together to come to some conclusions. So those are my disclosures. I've been trained by David Jenkins. So I've got everything from intellectual, there's guidelines work where we've done sweetener recommendations or done work related to sweeteners, uh, some diabetes associations, then also industry where I've inter had interaction where they have an interest in um, sweeteners. <clears throat> um, I want to set it up in kind of where Anne was left off in terms of sugar reduction. Um, really to, to sort of set the, the tone for this. I mean, sugars have emerged as this new public health uh, concern, dominant concern after about 40 years of low-fat dietary advice and really a fixation on fat. Sugars became kind of the new target in the early 2000s with the Bray and Popkin um, ecological analysis and AJCN, and it really sort of picked up from there. Um, and this is now reflected, it was a large literature in the, um, the popular media, both conventional and social. And these are some of the major framers of, of the news, like New York Times and London Financial Times and uh, Wall Street Journal uh, and lay source of scientific information like National Geographic, Scientific American, a lot of documentary films. So the media landscape is really saturated with this. I think the, the consumer um, understands that, uh, that sugar reduction is is, a, is is something that needs to be considered for public health, and it's reflected in our guidelines. So there's a bit of a lag here, but it will come. There we go. So um, what I've done is I put on the left the clinical practice guidelines as it relates to diabetes, uh, and on the right, I've put uh, dietary guidelines, like public health guidelines. Um, and what you can see here is it doesn't really, that distinction really doesn't matter as much here, but there's really a universal uh, recommendation to reduce added and free sugars with a particular focus on sugar sweetened beverages to between five and 10%, depending on the guideline where you land, but around five to 10%. Um, but all the guidelines really now are universal in their call for a reduction on sugars. So the question uh, is, you know, what's the role of low and no calorie sweeteners in this reduction in sugars? 
And uh, what do the different guidelines tell us just so we can um, understand, I think, the place of the, these new draft guidelines? Sorry, there is a delay, but it's coming. Um, so this is, I think I just went backwards, apologies. So these are the diabetes, I can see it on my screen, but here it comes on yours. These are the diabetes associations, uh, recommendations uh, sort of American through IDF where we don't have guidance and we have pending guidance and I'll share that with you at the end uh, because some of the evidence I'll go through is really what led to our ESD guidelines. But what you can see when you look certainly at American and, and Canadian guidelines, there is a recommendation. The recommendations are in support of the use of low no calorie sweeteners, but it's in so far as they're replacing sugars. So the replacement matters. And this is something I think Anne raised and really I think the frame here, which is it's not low and no calorie sweeteners in and of themselves for weight loss or weight management and reduction in cardiometabolic risk um, as is the way it's framed in the WHO recommendation. And these recommendations or these uh, aspects of the preamble from those recommend um, guidelines, it relates to the displacement of calories from sugars. Um, so in that context, we have uh, the clinical practice guidelines recommending the use of low no-calorie sweeteners from diabetes associations and obesity um, associations. So what do public health guidelines say about that? Well, here it's um, there's a little bit more um, variability um, as reflected in the WHO guidance, which uh, Anne just talked about, but we see that even in the U.S., um, so the 2015 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and that's the Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee Advisory Committee report, did not recommend using low no-calorie sweeteners, uh, but instead water, which is really the standard of care or healthier um, options or healthy options um, other than water, such as tea or coffee. Um, and the reason for that, I don't have that here, but was really um, really a paucity of, of evidence support, you know, of, of established benefits. And so it's really not about safety and none of these dietary guidelines are they at all uh, suggesting that there's a safety concern because the regulatory authorities in these countries have looked at it and it's been an asked and answered question as, as Anne said, this really relates to the intended benefits. Will the consumer get the intended benefit? If we look at the 2020, they re-reviewed uh, that evidence because it was thought to be still a very important question. And it was determined there was now sufficient evidence to acknowledge uh, that they, um, to support the use of low no calorie sweeteners, but uh, really um, viewed as sufficient to acknowledge that beverages uh, that contain low no calorie sweetened beverages may be useful uh, aid in weight management in adults, in particular that matrix, the beverage matrix, but a shift in the recommendations in the US. If we look at our um, new Canada's food guide, not so new anymore, but it came out in 2019, um, ahead of the pandemic, um, I think based on uh, some of the assessments at the time, because they were using a lot of the existing reviews and authoritative documents like the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the WHO Commission Review and so on, they came out with a uh, no well as there are no well established health benefits um, that they are not uh, recommended. So they should be we should be promoting nutritious foods and beverages instead. So recommending ostensibly against the use of low and no calorie sweeteners. Uh, and now we come to the WHO, this is the draft recommendation, so it hasn't been finalized, and uh, and this is not related to safety. I think we need to underline that, and Anne made that point. The WHO suggests that non-sugar uh, um, non -sugar sweeteners not be used as a means of achieving weight control or reducing risk of non-communicable diseases. And again, without um, really framing it in terms of sugars reduction. So it's not about using these to reduce sugars, it's really NSS in and of themselves as a means for weight control reducing risk of non-communicable diseases, which I think is something we're going to get into. <clears throat> so why the disconnect? So this is the disentangling piece. Why we, do we have our clinical practice guidelines really supporting the use of low no-calorie sweeteners uh, to, in the displacement of sugars and calories from sugars and our uh, dietary guidelines, public health really guidelines uh, recommending against them? Um, so to do that in terms of, I'm really going to use the, the WHO draft, uh, guideline as the basis, uh, for this, uh, sort of interrogation, if you like, of, of how we sort of got here. So there were four uh, commissioned reviews, two actual systematic reason analyses. The others, um, were, were, were scoping, uh, and one sorry related to diabetes, but two, uh, in particular that informed the, uh, the guideline, sorry, the, the, the systematic review, uh, meta-analysis. The second one came out in May and the guideline that was 
draft guideline published in July. So the first of these uh, was uh, published in 2019. Um, this one was much more restrictive uh, than the updated one, which I'll show you. This one, all of the uh, sweeteners had to be specified. So uh, in terms of uh, trials, that generally um, most trials do, or you're able to get that information, although many don't. But for the prospective cohorts or observational studies, it's very difficult with the dietary instruments uh, that we have, particularly food frequency questionnaires, unless you use like a 24-hour recall or food records. Uh, to get out the actual sweeteners. So a lot of evidence uh, was not, um, was it had to be discarded and wasn't used. And the um, conclusion of this commission systematic review meta-analysis, which was authoritative at the time, and, and I think did have influence um, on a number of, um, of different authorities, was there was no compelling evidence to indicate important health benefits of non-sugar sweeteners on a range of health outcomes, potential harms from consumption of, of sugar sweetener, non-sugar sweeteners could not be excluded. And you can just see here the uh, trial evidence on the uh, right, uh, looking at body weight. And you can see there is a signal in people that are overweight or obese, not in the normal weight. And overall, the conclusion that there was no effect um, from the, those trials that they did get. And then the prospective cohorts, they just had this uh, signals related to depression in one cohort study, uh, which really was the, uh, the reason that they could not exclude harm. Um, we um, wrote a, a letter to the editor regarding a very similar review that came to similar conclusions, uh, the Azad meta-analysis in the CMAJ, which I think has the highest altmetric score, one of the highest cited papers in the history of the CMAJ, as did a colleague uh, and friend in our department. At the time, she was at Harvard, uh, and she came to U of T after that, Vasanti Malik did the um, editorial to that first commission, WHO commissioned review. Um, and both of us came to similar conclusions uh, of these reviews is they really had lumped all of the available evidence, not distinguishing between the replacement or the comparator. Um, and in the case of the Azad paper, um, it, it had serious consequences because the, based on their entry criteria, all of the RCTs that they had, the comparator was uh, did not allow for energy displacement. It was either water comparator, placebo, or matched weight loss diet. So it didn't allow for energy displacement, and you wouldn't reasonably expect to see weight loss. There's not magic here. It's really this displacement of calories is the way, uh, and sugars that the way that this is that the sweeteners are working. And it, the, another methodological issue being the reverse causality question, which is really um, a serious uh, a serious issue with this question. It's one that I, I teach in my course. You know, and speaking with Frank Hugh, he actually sees it really as intractable, um, you know, in the cohorts. It's very, very hard to get rid of just because there are um, so many that are going to use these, and, and Anne made this, this point, as a strategy to lose weight and reduce risk. So it's not that these sweeteners are causing overweight and obesity and the downstream cardiometabolic complications like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. It's more because they're at risk for these conditions, or overweight or obese. Um, or they have those risk factors that they're um, consuming them. So they're cons they consuming them because of the conditions. It's not that the sweeteners are causing uh, the conditions. Uh, Dr. Malik uh, came to a similar conclusion about the nature of the comparator and this mixing of caloric and non-caloric comparators and that need to really um, fine tune the question. Um, it was a very well done systematic analysis. Jörg Mirpol led it and he actually trained me in grade. He's an excellent methodologist. It was really well done. I think it was just really a case of um, needing that nutrition content expertise to, to inform it. As it relates to the reverse uh, causality question and the residual confounding that were discussed um, by Anne, this is something that uh, was raised and has been raised in different letters. This was one that we had, had done as well uh, in partnership with Vasanti and, and the postdoc Tosif Khan in relation uh, to another paper. But this idea of using uh, most of the observational studies uh, use baseline or prevalent exposure and, and touched on this where you measure, uh, you do a, a measurement of diet at the beginning of the study and then you'll go the 10, 15 or 20 years of follow up and look at the outcomes um, without looking at the change uh, in intake or the increase in intake of these and how it relates to um, the, the downstream uh, disease outcomes. And none of and um, the studies that are there, there's very few, but um, that do the change or substitution analyses, which allow us to overcome some of this. So there's been a number of methodolo this methodological work that's been done by the Harvard group and others looking at you know baseline prevalent exposure versus change or lag change. And change appears to be among those measurements the best in terms of managing the the uh, the issue, certainly of residual confounding, giving more biologically plausible. 
outcomes. And this is not just for sweeteners, this is for all um, exposures that relates to weight, um, some more biologically plausible relationships, more reproducible um, and more robust uh, relationships um, using repeated measures. The, the other way is to do substitution analyses, which mimic a trial. And really what we do in trials, we're actually looking at the, the intended substitution in this case to displace sugars and calories from sugars. So that really important to understand that question as a way to approach that and ensuring you have sufficient adjustment in particular of adiposity. And, and this was raised by, by Ann to, to mitigate that. So we're not alone in making those um, comments. There have been a number of editorials, reviews, and has been on some of those, and, and I have, and consensus statements that have really, I think, called for um, a new approach to this area of literature, in particular in synthesizing it and in designing the studies that in particular takes into account the nature of the comparator and addresses the reverse causality issues that are, are really, really present um, in this literature. <clears throat> So this takes us and, and, and showed this to the updated expanded WHO commission review. So I showed you the 2019, the TOES meta-analysis in the BMJ, was, we'll call it version 1.0. This is the 2.0 of the systematic reviews, meta-analyses in the general population to inform the, um, the new draft guideline. This one included um, all both specified and unspecified sweeteners. So it had a, a bigger uh, net was cast that was more inclusive. Um, than the uh, the other, and then it was updated uh, for new studies, new RCTs and new cohorts. So it had many more RCTs, non-RCTs and, and observational studies, as you can see there. And Anne already showed you uh, these data, but this is just to support that nice little infographic as it relates to the RCTs. You can just see where they replace sugars. So that displacement of calories from sugars, you do see this signal, this 0.76. Um, and even with the explicit replacement, which was one of the uh, conclusions. This is where the entry criteria is. They're already consuming sugars. They're randomized to continue or to displace those with a low, no calorie sweeteners. You still see um, a nice reduction. Um, so they, in updating the systematic review and analysis, they did take into account the nature of the comparator. Um, Jason Montez actually had reached out to us about our uh, pending systematic review, which I'll share with you in a moment that we were doing for the EASD. Uh, and based on, I think, a lot of that commentary and, and, and really it's, it's kudos to the uh, the WHO team that did this, that they did um, change their analysis plan to uh, account for the nature of the comparator. And when one does that, you do see where it's replacing sugars, this uh, reduction in weight, you see the reduction in calories that was uh, also shown there in the infographic and, and went through those data. If we look at the cohorts, though, here we see uh, the increased risk is the data, most of it, again, based on baseline prevalent exposure, not change or substitution analyses, where you see the increased risk for diabetes and, you know, the cardiometabolic uh, downstream, the cardiovascular outcomes, hypertension, even all-cause mortality. So, so because they use GRADE, and Anne went through this, and GRADE gives more weight to RCTs than observational studies, but allows for a series of upgrades and downgrades that uh, allow them to more meet in the middle where observational studies can be upgraded for dose response and RCTs are often downgraded uh, for a number of methodological issues. Um, you, you can come to very similar levels of evidence, but in general, the RCTs will start higher, observational studies start lower. Uh, the conclusion, and Anne showed the narrative of that conclusion, but was that the low to moderate certainty, there was higher certainty evidence supporting the RCTs than the cohorts, uh, but the cohorts raised the question of really the long-term effects, and we can have that debate about what that means uh, in terms of these associations of increased risk needing to be answered, but really putting forward this issue of the risk causality in their conclusion is something that needs to be addressed, but, but giving higher evidence to the RCT uh, data. This is the systematic review meta-analysis, the commission review, not the WHO conclusion. So when the WHO um, took on board the two uh, commissioned uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, in particular the updated one, um, they decided, they weighted more the, the evidence because it was based on prioritized outcomes. So it's really patient important, public health important, big outcomes like CV death and CV and all-cause mortality. Uh, because of those, and, and most of the trials are based on intermediate biomarkers or body weight, um, even though it was lower certainty evidence, they gave it more weight in the conclusion. And so what you get is... is Conclusion. Sorry, there's a real lag. You can kind of see it superimposed, and we have an internet connection problem. 
And there it is with despite the internet connection problem. Sorry for that. So overall certainty of the evidence, the overall certainty was considered low and is based on undesirable effects of non-sugar sweeteners on those prioritized health outcomes observed in prospective cohorts, which were very low to low, but really that was the basis for not recommending low no calorie sweeteners. And they acknowledge the discordant results, obviously in nutrition, when we're looking, doing guidelines, we're looking for concordance between our RCTs of intermediate biomarkers, where we don't have those large clinical outcome trials and our prospective cohorts of those big clinical uh, events. Um, and here, they, the discordant results were, they really explained away in terms of the timing that those sh what they so-called short-term effects in the trials uh, may not be relevant over the longer term based on the evidence from the observation studies, even though it was of lower certainty evidence. So is there a evidence to address the discordance? Uh, well, that's something that we actually took on as part of the update of our EASD guidelines almost 20 years in the making that we, in terms of our last ones were in 2004 and, and we've been doing this for 15 years and, and we've done a, a, a series of, of commissioned reviews and it, it's just it's really been a, a very painstaking process but we're almost there um, and in our carbohydrate chapter so we presented this at the ESD uh, in September we also presented it at our at our DNSG meeting in June in, in Athens um, uh, a, a summary of these guidelines and our low and no calorie sweetened recommendation comes in the carbohydrate chapter or section when they're published, you'll be able to see it there. Um, we, uh, the guidelines group commissioned, uh, two systematic reviews and meta-analyses to uh, look at the question of sweeteners. And in particular, um, probably because I'm involved with the committee and, and, and a lot of others that I think have, uh, you know, very good methodological sort of hats on, you know, really was to do these systematic reasoning analyses differently than the others to specifically address these issues, the nature of the comparator and the residual confounding, in particular the reverse causality in the cohorts to try to uh, take a methodological approach that could help to address those, to reconcile the differences that we were seeing between the two, uh, to really understand what the, the impact of these were based on the available evidence that we have. So with that in mind, we had one of RCTs and one of cohorts. This is the, and they were just published this year. Um, so this one uh, was led by Naima McGlenn, a really capable master's student with us um, uh, last uh, few years uh, who finished uh, last year. She just pub we just published this uh, back in March. Um, this is a network meta-analysis of trials. And the way we set it up really to get that nature of the comparator is we pre-specified three comparisons of clinical and I would argue public health importance. So to really get at how these uh, the sweeteners are working within different contexts. So one being that intended substitution with energy displacement, which we, uh, we saw the, the uh, commissioned review that came out in May from the WHO uh, also looked at. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at a single matrix, the most important source in the diet, which is beverages. So we, we wanted to focus on that just to so not to confuse the data. So looking at low and no calorie sweetened beverages for sugar sweetened beverages, this intended substitution. The second being water for sugar sweetened beverages, which is really a standard of care. We all want to recommend water. Um, and so, and, and that's certainly clear from the recommendations that are there. So wanting to look at that as the standard of care substitution, where again, you have energy displacement. So very similar to the low and no calorie sweetened beverage for sugar sweetened beverage um, substitution. And then the third would be to really get at the comparison between the two that intended substitution with the standard of care, the low no calories beverages for water, what we call the reference substitution without energy displacement. We thought this literature, because it doesn't, uh, there's not a lot of comparisons you can see there between water and sugar sweetened beverages, uh, or even water and, and, and uh, what we, I've labeled here as, as non-sugar uh, be beverages, um, because there's not as much as we have between uh, the, the low no calorie sweet beverages and the sugar sweetened beverages, it was really a good opportunity to use something called network meta-analysis that allows us to look at those traditional pairwise comparisons that a meta-analysis would look at, but also the indirect comparisons where you have a common comparator so you can increase the information size. So this is what the network plot looked like for that. Um, so we looked at those three pre-specified substitutions and here's what we found. So we looked at 20 uh, pre-specified outcomes so these were outcomes pre-specified by our guideline committee that were used for all of our systematic reviews and meta-analyses, not just of the question around low and no calorie sweeteners. This was one of the questions we looked at in the guidelines. We've done over 20 commissioned reviews um, for, for that guideline. Um, and when we look at these, when you look at weight, BMI, body fat, very similar findings to what the WHO commission review showed. We see uh, the 
intended weight loss with the intended substitution. Uh, and because of uh, applying grade uh, in the context of network meta-analysis, there's a great extension for that. We had moderate certainty evidence actually for the body weight. Most of the evidence was moderate in this case. There was some low, but moderate in general. We see it for BMI and body fat and liver fat. Uh, and then in general, all the other outcomes, they were a little bit imprecise, so not statistically significant, but generally all favoring uh, the same direction of, of benefit, favoring the low and no calorie sweetened beverages. If we look at the standard of care substitution, this is water for sugar sweetened beverages. Um, here, we didn't actually see any reductions. We saw a tendency very close liver fat. Some of them were very close. There wasn't a lot of pair uh, of the uh, pairwise comparisons here. There was definitely a power issue. These were a little more imprecise, but in general, all of them favoring the water, but just none of them statistically significant. And if we look at the reference, this is comparing low, no calorie for water. Here, we really saw no differences. There were a few exceptions. So the low, no calorie sweetened beverages seem to do a little bit better for water on body weight and systolic blood pressure, and a little uh, worse on HbA1c. Um, because in all of these cases, the direction of effect or the benefit favored both the water and low, low no calorie beverages in their own pairwise comparisons, um, in that both showed reductions they were just a little more for the low no calorie beverages for the body weight and systolic blood pressure, and a little more for the water for HbA1c. We didn't see that this is as really as signals of, of concern, and it really it supported the conclusion that there was re that really uh, was very similar uh, in terms of their effects, as you saw from. They're the first two substitutions and then the head to head. So uh, overall, um, we, we, we felt that there was uh, evidence, good indication that it supported their use where they were replacing sugars. Now for the ob observational studies, um, this was led by Jennifer Lee, who is actually in the audience today, um, who's doing her PhD with, with Mary LeBay, uh, really bright and incredible MPH student that came to us to do this actually as an MPH project, but turned into something much bigger and more. And so we were thankful she persevered with it. Um, she, uh, we applied here an approach to, uh, to mitigate the reverse causality, mitigate some of the residual confounding by doing uh, the, the substitution analyses, which again, allow us to mimic a trial um, in, in looking at those comparisons within uh, the context of a, of a cohort. Uh, these are not um, well established. There's not a lot of cohorts that have published um, on these, but it is a growing um, analysis that you'll see in many in terms of modeling the exposure, looking at those substitutions. And the other is to look at change where, again, this is a bit limited because not every cohort has those repeated measures. Uh, the Harvard cohorts, for example, do the FFQ every four years. A lot of other cohorts, they may have only done it in a subset, you know, such as WHI, a small subset once, but not beyond that, many don't have those repeated measures, but for those that have it. So we wanted to look at those uh, observation studies that had done these substitutions uh, and also adjusted for adiposity to try to mitigate, again, the reverse causality, mitigate the residual confounding. And we published this in Diabetes Care actually just in September. Um, so this came out after the WHO draft guideline uh, and something we actually submitted through the, um, the, uh, the guideline uh, consultation, um, this data, because we felt that it informed uh, the evidence. So if we look at the intended substitution, so we see the opposite that I showed you on the infographic from uh, the WHO, um, and where we have a, a lot of red, where you're seeing increased associations with diabetes, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and mortality. Here you see the opposite. So if you actually model it as the displacement of low no, of sugar sweet beverages using low no calorie sweet beverages, you actually see a decrease in body weight, associated decrease in body weight, an associated decrease in obesity incidence, a reduction in CHD incidence, and then even really big uh, public health important outcomes like CV mortality and all-cause mortality are reduced as opposed to increased. The evidence similar though, we've seen with other observational studies and that it's low to very low still. Um, but it's uh, surprising there were quite a few cohorts that had done this for some questions uh, and less for others. Um, so it is a little more limited in terms of the available observational studies, but we do have uh, not an unreasonable amount, certainly for like CHD and, and, um, and, and, and diabetes. <clears throat> if we look at the standard of care substitution, which is water, um, you see uh, the same benefits for the, the uh, we looked at all the same outcomes, but these are the ones we could find for water. Overall, you're seeing very similar um, reductions, similar patterns uh, where you see this benefit where water is displacing sugar sweetened beverages. And if we look at the reference, which is comparing the two, um, so now getting uh, at that comparison between the two, we don't see um, any differences. We have far fewer uh, 
um, cohort comparisons here. Um, we have three as it relates to diabetes, which is, is not too bad, but the others are based on just one, but overall no signals there suggesting um, harm. So again, the conclusion that in the intended substitution, replacing sugar-sweetened beverages, there appear to be advantages, associated advantages that are similar to those seen with, with water. The change analyses um, also gave us a different outcome than what you see when you do baseline prevalent exposure as your exposure method. So here the body weight is, uh, so the uh, increase in intake by one serving, it's 330 mil serving, is associated with a decrease in body weight, a decrease in waist circumference, and non-significant increase in type 2 diabetes. So you're seeing a different signal uh, than you see when you do the baseline uh, or prevalent exposure. So why do the public health guidelines not take this approach? I think that's a good question. And I think it's a good one too. And I think probably it's coming. I, I, it, we'll get into it because the WHO did address this in their limitations, but this is an approach the WHO did take for saturated fat. So it was acknowledged the dietary guidelines, you know, must carefully consider the effective replacement nutrient. I mean, everything in nutrition is really about the replacement. So for the saturated fat question, they also did not find an association with all-cause mortality, CHD, CHD mortality, but they found when you looked at the substitution analyses, same analyses I showed you in the prospective cohorts, then yes, when you're using polyunsaturated fat, N6, N3 um, mixed PUFAs, or, um, you, may, you actually see a reduction um, in um, CHD um, in, in that context, and the dietary guidelines need to um, to acknowledge that. And the WHO did um, acknowledge that in the draft guideline, that it was important. We need more robust exposure assessments and patterns of use. They just didn't do it uh, for this one. And probably it's assumed that that evidence wasn't there. I, I'd like to think it was still part of their analysis plan, but it, there wasn't enough there. So I think our, our um, published diabetes care uh, commission review for the ESD guidelines can be very relevant uh, to answering this call for more research. So how do the data align with values and preferences, which is another question, uh, you know, the grade considers. Well, we need to reduce sugars and, and, and address this, and, and that's just uh, shown there. And there is some data in terms of values, preference when you actually survey people that use sweeteners, the vast majority are using them to reduce sugars and reduce calories. Like this is what they were designed to do, as, as Anne said, like when they were originally designed, and this is how consumers are using them uh, in surveys of, of users. Um, and if you look at something like this, which I think is another nice example, this is the National Weight Control Registry, Jim Hill and Rena Wing. Uh, manage. But when you look at those people that have been successful at weight loss and they uh, survey them, uh, what they find is the majority do consume, almost 80% actually consume low no calorie sweetened beverages. Uh, and they felt that they helped with their calorie control overall. Uh, and they were very important in weight loss and in weight maintenance uh, for, for many of them, uh, over 40%. So how do we reconcile the biological mechanisms, um, which I think still are there, but that they give biological plausibility, I think, to what we see in the observational studies when we see those adverse signals. And they were certainly invoked as potential explanations in the, in the WHO discussion and, and even in the um, Commission Systematic Review and Analysis. And just to give a couple, we, we just got, we, um, got this competitive grant through IFANS uh, to look at the um, acute RCTs that could really get at this uncoupling hypothesis idea that the uncoupling of calories from, uh, uh, from sweetness may lead to metabo downstream metabolic and endocrine dysregulation, in particular hormones of food intake regulation, hormones of glucose homeostasis, that these can be affected when we remove the calories from the sweetness equation. Um, so this has been looked at carefully in a number um, of RCTs. So we wanted to look at it and really dissect it and look at it carefully. So we wanted to look at the uncoupling delayed coupling. And then the other is coupling where people are now finding too, when you, when you put it together with calories, maybe they have, um, they have their, their effects. So we wanted to look at all three of these conditions. Um, we looked at a single matrix again, this is low and no calories in beverages. So if we look at uncoupling, um, this is very complicated. We again use network analysis to increase the information size. This is a league table. So the way we organized that it, just to make it easy. So we looked at individual sweeteners on the left blends and most occur as blends in the food supply. So the most popular blend would be like aspartame and ACE-K in most beverages. And you'll also find sucralose, but very few exist as an isolated sweetener. So this is a very relevant uh, way to look at it, just as it, as it is in the, in the cohorts or in the RCTs where they actually use uh, the beverages that are on the market because they're not using single sweeteners. They're using them actually together. 
water as the non, you know, the standard of care, non-caloric comparator. And then the other side where there's a bit of color, those are your caloric comparators. Those are glucose, sucrose, and fructose. So what we did is this is, uh, this analysis actually caused quite a bit of power. So there were a number of things statistically significant. We pre-specified different effect sizes. So we looked at um, would be trivial or unimportant, like it's statistically significant significant, but it's very, it doesn't meet our, our pre-specified minimally important difference. Low, uh, small, but important. So it's a, it, at least one minimally important uh, level of a minimally important difference or more. Moderate, which would be like two levels of minimally important difference, large and very large. And so the white is uh, either no effect or trivial. The blue would be small. The darker blue would be moderate. We have like a purple, which is large. And we have a black, which is very large. So, but for this one, you just have the, the, um, the small and moderate with the Trivial. But what you can see here is comparing the sweeteners, and this gives a nice comparison of sweeteners, we don't see any difference. This is for postprandial glucose. They don't raise glucose. Uh, we don't see any difference with the blends or the water, which is good, where you actually see the differences with the caloric comparators, which makes sense. Glucose raises blood glucose levels postprandially, um, as does sucrose and fructose less so. So that's where you see the differences with the caloric comparators. You don't see any glucose raising response from consuming sweeteners. If we look at insulin, same thing, and this is getting at cephalic response, this uncoupling again of calories and sweetness, and maybe the sweetness through the sweet taste receptor may elicit this cephalic response that leads to early secretion of insulin, and you may get an insulin response. We don't see anything across the sweeteners, the blends or water. Um, we only see it uh, for the caloric sweeteners, which makes sense. Again, the glucose, which is a, a large effect size, which you'd expect, glucose is very glycemic, raises and, and elicits a strong insulin response, the sucrose and the fructose. We looked at some of the, uh, these were the ones that actually the, the, the trials looked at themselves with some of the uh, markers, the incretin hormones that relate to glucose homeostasis and food intake regulation. So GLP-1, no differences, only sucrose. So nothing with the sweeteners. Um, this is for GIP. This is a very large effect for sucrose, but nothing for the, we just had aspartame and water. There's very, there's less comparisons here, not as big as it is for postprandial glucose. Nothing here for uh, ghrelin, uh, nothing for glucagon. If we look at delayed coupling, same, nothing here for postprandial glucose, nothing here for insulin, nothing for GIP. And if we look at the coupling, and this is actually combining them, you can imagine having your diet beverage with your food. Um, you know, here, uh, we don't have a lot of comparisons, but again, it's not showing anything when you couple uh, the calories. Dana Small published a, a paper suggesting maybe it was the coupling. Um, we wrote a letter to that in terms of how she analyzed it, but this, we were looking at this because it's an important question and we don't see any differences. So to really get at the unco this uncoupling of, of sweetness and calories and looking at different ways, we don't see anything that would support um, what we see with the, the observation studies. In terms of microbiome, when this was raised, the Suez paper really kicked this off in terms of humans showing this glucose intolerance being um, uh, being, being done through changes in the microbiome. There were a lot of issues with the human trial and it wasn't controlled. It was the, uh, at the ADI, so the highest sort of 100% of the ADI. Um, and they did before versus after to actually show the difference. This actually stimulated a lot of research dollars and priorities, including in Canada, where there was a, a Best Brains was put together and, and, and an RFP went out related to this, which we were fortunate to get some funding for. I know Mary LeBay here got some funding for it. So a, a number of others did. And so a lot of other groups tried to replicate this, but using a placebo controlled RCT design and looking at le different levels of sweeteners and more than just saccharin, which they looked at in the Suez paper. So here is with aspartame and sucralose. This was Dylan McKay at the University of Manitoba. Didn't show any differences in glucose tolerance, no uh, microbiome changes. This is um, work that was done in Chile, no, uh, no effect. Uh, and sorry, this was, I should say, on uh, sucralose um, in particular. And then this one that looked at saccharin, which is actually what they looked at in the, in, the, in the Suez paper, again, showing nothing. So we've had a series of RCTs now, better power uh, than certainly the Suez. They're controlled, randomized uh, at different levels uh, related to the ADI, and we're not seeing any differences. So when we balance the totality of the evidence, what did we find for our new ASD recommendations? So here's what we actually are going to, we presented in Stockholm at the ASD meeting and in, in, in Greece at our DNSG meeting, but here's the recommendations that stands right now, uh, should be going forward to the ASD guidelines committee um, that will be um, adjudicating on our, 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 um, our guideline before it goes to diabetologia. So non-nutritive sweeteners may be used to replace sugars and beverages and foods. But again, the framing here is important because it's the replacement of sugars. So that's the context, unlike 
what we have in, in the WHO recommendation, which doesn't relate to the, the comparator. <clears throat> uh, and it fits very nicely in with the other diabetes and obesity guidelines that really where it's displacing calories from sugars um, and it, uh, you're actually seeing the, the benefit and, and this is where it can be recommended. So conclusions, although there are concerns that low no calorie seniors may not have the intended benefits, our network of the RCTs that leverage all those the available direct and indirect do show uh, the intended benefit as it relates to weight loss and it's similar to water. Um, the uh, acute RCTs I think are important because they really get at that biological plausibility question. We don't see any effect on metabolic endocrine responses which regulate glucose and food intake regulation. The improvement does appear to translate to what you see in the observation studies when we model the exposure carefully to try to mitigate some of the reverse causality and some of the residual confounding using change and substitution analyses, which I showed you, where you see the opposite. You see weight loss, re re associated reductions in obesity, incidence, CHD, all-cause mortality, again, similar to water. And that overall, the certainty was moderate for the RCTs, low for the um, for the cohorts, but it provides a good indication that they might be uh, useful. And there are a number of ongoing RCTs, which I think will further add evidence that can be uh, considered. So just want to thank my amazing team that was so instrumental in putting these data together. And, and so uh, I think feel so proud that we were part of uh, some of this work and just some of the sponsors of that work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks for, for this really interesting talk. Thank you for disentangling the evidence and pointing out a couple really important things that the nature of the comparator is important, the statistical analysis is important, and then suggesting some of the putative uh, mechanisms. Thank you.